through this computer. I got something I'm gonna put in the chat box for everyone. Just a welcome. Well. And we will go ahead and get started. So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for hanging out with us on this Monday night, beginning of the week. Uh, we are happy that you are here. My name is Amy Combs. I'm the PTI manager here at ECAC, the Exceptional Children's Assistance Center. And tonight I am absolutely thrilled to be um, hanging out here with Billy Pickens and Maya Warren. Uh, two self-advocates that both experience um, either blindness or vision impairment. Um, and the timing is perfect. Well, it's always perfect timing uh, when we're going to talk about self-advocacy because it's super important. Um, but especially because October is Blindness Awareness Month. And so um, they said, hey, let's pull something together. And I said, yes, let's do this. And so here we are. I will be hanging out in the background. Um, I'm going to be monitoring the chat and the Q&A, and so if you do have questions, we ask that you put them in either the chat box or the Q&A box, and then I'll be monitoring that um, and can let them know what's in there. And so uh, without further ado, I will pass the mic and we will get started. All right, and uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome uh, to our webinar. Uh, uh, for uh, Blindness Awareness and Honor of Blindness Awareness Month. Uh, my name is Billy Pickens, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, and I'm joined by a good friend, Maya Warren. So I'm ECAC's Youth Outreach Coordinator, and I've been in this position for a little over a year now. So my goal is to make sure I do uh, outreach and make sure the youth and our voice are heard in our communities and in our state. Um, so we do that different ways. I myself am a self-advocate, so it uh, feels perfect for me, and I'm myself totally blind, progressive hearing loss. Uh, so this webinar hits under the nose pretty much. Um, with and I'm, I have a genetic condition called noise disease, which is a hereditary condition, which um, I'll get more into later. But i uh, definitely glad that to have you here, and, and we definitely won't definitely make sure uh, we use your time wisely and, and get started. And so I now want to uh, let you know that. As part of our, as part of our uh, work with the youth, we have a youth advisory team, and it's made up of multiple people with a diverse array of disabilities across the state. And we do events like this, do webinars, and we also meet every other Tuesday. Um, ages 14 to 26 are welcome, and they could have an IEP or a 504 and neither. Uh, but the goal is to make sure that youth with disabilities throughout our state are definitely heard. And um, I'm honored. Uh, to, to say that while I will be doing a great deal of talking and sharing my story today, I'm not alone in that, and that I have one of our members and someone I might to call a good friend of mine uh, for many years now, but she just got on, on board with the team recently, and that is uh, my good friend, Maya Warren. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome in the one, the only Maya Warren to uh, tell you about herself. And Hi. So thank you for that uh, <laughs> introduction, Billy, and I'm excited to be here. My name is Maya Warren. I am a self-advocate, but in addition to that, I am a community advocate for albinism, invisible disabilities, and invisible chronic illnesses. I also have a YouTube channel where I feature a podcast called the Better Not Bitter podcast, where I bring on guests um, to give them a platform to share their unique stories regarding their disability, medical condition, or chronic illness. Um, I also do a whole plethora of things um, on that channel, like releasing original music, um, but the bulk of my time is spent in advocacy for those causes. Oh, and I forgot to mention, I have something called ocular cutaneous albinism, which means I lack pigmentation in my eyes, hair, and skin. And as a result of that, I am African-American. I just like pigmentation. But in addition to having albinism, I have something that's called a vision impairment. In addition to that, I have two chronic illnesses, one by the name of chronic migraine disease and the other by the name of hypermobility spectrum disorder. Wow, thank you very much, Maya. A lot of, lot of great, a lot of hats you're wearing there. Busy woman, I like that. <laughs> um, but anyway, so as part of our 
turning insight and vision into awareness webinar. Uh, we're going to be talking about a few things, but uh, we're going to start with the history of Blindness Awareness Month and how it came to be. And it's going to be a, a night of discussion. We're just going to talk a little bit about, share our stories, uh, talk about what we've learned as uh, people, blind people and low vision people uh, throughout our lives and uh, really just talk about how what we've learned has impacted us and also what we would like you to learn also um, through our stories. And so I'll start with a little history um, here about Blindness Awareness Month. So Blindness Awareness Month launched in October of 2009 from the Little Rock Foundation, an organization, and I'm probably gonna butcher this, Vor Voorhees, New Jersey, dedicated to serving families with blind or visually impaired children. Tina and Rocco, and I'm probably gonna butcher this too, Fiorent Fiorentina formed the Little Rock Foundation one year after the birth of their child, Rocco, who was born four months premature and blind. As amb ambassador for the Little Rock Foundation, Rocco has shown the world blindness doesn't prevent people from living life to the fullest. Blindness Awareness Month seeks to accomplish many things. Education, as companies around the world teach the public about good eye health and the latest research and innovations in the treatment of eye disorders. Inspiration, like we're doing tonight, as stories are shared about blind or visually impaired people accomplishing incredible things most sighted people do not attempt. And advocacy, organizations garner support for more resources, research, access, and laws that enable people with visual impairments to live fully productive lives and contribute equally to their communities. There is no shortage of ways to learn about, celebrate, and support the visually impaired community throughout Blindness Awareness Month. And so now that we've uh, got a little history about Blindness Awareness Month, we will now launch into the uh, big part of our discussion, and that is the sharing of our stories. So uh, my, I've been raised that uh, the let ladies go first. So if you want to go first, <laughs> or I'll go first, or whatever works for you. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll go ahead and go first, I guess. Um, okay. So where to begin? Where to begin? So um, I was born with a condition called ocular cutaneous albinism which means, as I said before, I lack pigmentation in my eyes, hair, and skin. Um, and in addition to that condition, what happens is a lot of people with albinism are born with a lack of development in the retina um, and other component, components of the eye, which lends uh, a lot of us to being visually impaired, some legally blind and some totally blind. It, it, it's a diverse spectrum um, of how albinism and the associated vision impairment operates. Um, so as a result of that, from an early age, when I was in school, um, in elementary school, I had the giant textbooks with large print. Um, I had a, a, a giant um, piece of glass that was in the shape of a dome used for magnification. I had a, what we would call a monocular, which is basically one half of a binocular. So think of it like that. And it helped see, helped me see distances. And I had accommodations through an IP. Um, so I had all of these um, supports from my early age. However, that did not stop me from dealing with things like bullying um, and having to mature as a result of having such a disability. And so move on to middle school. I'm still navigating the scene as a student, um, not really knowing the ins and outs of my condition of albinism and even my vision impairment. I just knew I needed these devices to function in class. And so 
eventually I took it upon myself to research and figure out, okay, what, what's up with my condition? And what's up with this vision impairment thing to connect the dots? And so the more I researched, the more, um, what's the word? The more confident I'll say I became that albinism for me was not necessarily a curse. Like I was kind of led to believe and treat it as such, but albinism was more of a condition that lends itself to different opportunities. So it, that meant I had to unpack a lot of big, bitterness and angerness that I, uh, anger that I dealt with as a result of bullying. But it eventually led to me uh, in my freshman year of high school, well, I'll say eighth grade, um, becoming a full-time advocate for albinism. So whenever I would <laughs> uh, have like a new semester in school, every class, and I mean every class, I would stand up uh, and introduce myself with the permission of my teacher. And I would educate my fellow students on what albinism was and what vision impairment was. And, and I basically would always make the disclaimer, like you will see me using this telescope or this, this magnification device, please respect my equipment because I find I found um, at that age, a lot of people are curious. And because of that curiosity, people will just randomly pick up your devices <laughs> or, or the things that help you regarding your disability. So I had to kind of set those boundaries early on, especially heading into high school. Um, so even in the eighth grade, I had opportunities to speak and present, um, spoken word pieces before the Guilford County School Board. Um, I had opportunities to meet with my teachers and just answer questions they had. Then in high school, I had even more opportunities to advocate on, uh, during Black History Month, um, alongside the Western Regional Superintendent for Guilford County. Um, I advocated during Poetry Club. Pretty much what happens is when you have a disability, and I talk about this a lot, you become not a self-advocate because you want to. A lot of times it's out of necessity, but what ends up yes. happening is because you're in those spaces and places, you, by nature of just being present, disrupt able-bodied uh, structures. You disrupt environments in a good way not necessarily in a negative way but you disrupt those environments and so I was finding that time after time I was put in these places before people and officials and professors and structures in ways that would disrupt the environment that gave me opportunities to not just self-advocate but advocate for those who were in my shoes and coming after me um, and for a while it felt really awkward <laughs> Like nobody ever just wakes up and like, I'm going to be an advocate. You know, most of the time you find that a chain of events and life events kind of lead you down that path. And so then I graduated uh, high school and, you know, after having my, my arms and legs into different activities um, and, you know, playing basketball, being a jazz musician, I transitioned into college and it is in college where my chronic illnesses progressed. Um, so in 2015, I was diagnosed with chronic migraine disorder, but I've had hypermobility spectrum disorder my entire life. And so those illnesses started to kind of come together and interfere with a lot of, you know, what bit of independence I had. And so not only in college was I having to advocate for you know, self-advocate for my vision impairment, my albinism, but now I have two other things that I'm self-advocating for. And so same thing like high school, middle school, I was being put in these environments, not necessarily because I wanted to, but because I was there and I ended up having opportunities to kind of educate and, and teach people um, what it's like to deal with chronic illness, disability, vision impairment, even in college. And so now <laughs> I graduated with my bachelor's in kinesiology in the spring. And um, to kind of wrap it up, I've been a full-time advocate ever since. Love it. That's excellent. Um, so I was thinking a little bit about 
what the word awareness means to me and, and not just what it means, but how it applies to my journey um, as a person with disability. And I, I really, at first I didn't think much of it or think it really mattered, but as time went on, I actually thought awareness is a lot. Awareness can really be part of the defining factor between uh, someone, especially someone with a disability or anyone finding success or just uh, finding within themselves to advocate or finding ways to advocate. Um, and I think about a lot of things that played a role in my life and a lot of it comes down to awareness and access. And not just awareness of materials or tools or uh, devices or equipment. Yeah, that was important, but awareness of the power within myself, awareness of the ability to advocate and stand up for myself. Um, and I still have to say that, um, so I was, I was born totally blind in, in both eyes, progressive hearing loss. Um, but the first bit of awareness I'll point out is that I was blessed in the fact that my family, I had, uh, had, had a history of noise and just blindness in general. So both my mom's parents were blind um, and my grandfather had the condition called uh, Norris disease, which I had. And basically how it works is it's, uh, it's basically a chromosome uh, related condition. So the males are the carrier, carrier or males are inheritors and the females are carriers. So my grandfather had it and he had three girls. Um, all three girls would go in to have boys. So um, they would all become carriers or inheritors of it. And so I also have two blind cousins. Um, and so and they were older than me. So I had a great deal of mentorship and, and definitely my parents were ready to make sure that I learned as much as I could and treat me like anyone else. Um, so especially my early life was very productive. Uh, my father was a bit more hesitant than my mother because he had no blind people in his family. So he was more about finding a cure for it. But at the same time, I think that he was very much up for the, uh, the, the reality that um, not only would I be totally blind, progressive hearing loss, but I would have to adjust to that while I could. Um, not to say that maybe one day I couldn't see, but he was just realizing that, well, you know, I might as well make things happen while I can. So as a kid, I definitely had a lot of access and a lot of uh, awareness to things around me, even at a young age, uh, being able to feel things, being able to use my other senses. And so, you know, my parents, my dad especially would take me out into nature and he would let me touch things and, you know, let me feel what was out there and animals and, and bugs. And, uh, you know, people would think that, sometimes would think that was the grossest thing ever. But for me, it was kind of my way of connecting with nature. I would touch buses and, and really how, knowing how things felt so I could uh, picture it in my brain. So, um, as I went on, you know, my parents were very good about even early on giving me, you know, some smaller chores that could help me and things that could really uh, benefit me. And then I went to daycare uh, at a young age also. And what they started doing was they started bringing in VI teachers. Of uh, those who don't know, they, that stands for visually impaired teachers. And they're specifically designed to help, you know, blind people learn Braille and orientation and mobility skills. So I learned how to use a cane at a very young age and realized my surroundings. I think one of the benefits early on was definitely that I became very observant to my surroundings. So I just knew when things were out of place or something wasn't right, or I just always had that uh, feeling and knew what was going on. Um, so time goes on and I go to kindergarten and because I had an early start on learning Braille, I was really able to uh, get ahead of the curve and I was able to be in a mainstream classroom um, at a young age. I didn't start right away. I was kind of in and out of it, but I was also in the VI room getting more, uh, getting more education on Braille and, and bettering uh, mo my mobility skills also. And uh, I went through kindergarten and things went well during elementary school um, because I had that head start. Um, and I really felt like I didn't have to advocate too much. Um, I made a lot of friends, but I mostly stuck with the people that were also in the VI room and we kind of stuck together. But I did make a lot of sighted friends. I was very good at integrating with people. Um, you know, I related to people when we, we would uh, trade movies or music that we were listening to or anything like that. And I mean, they always had questions, 
and they were always curious, like Maya was saying, and sometimes you have to really stand up and say, hey, uh, yeah, I know you're curious and I respect that, but just ask me first. Like, don't just go pick up my king and start walking or don't just go uh, picking up uh, my brailler or anything like that. But they, they were very curious. Um, so, uh, but they were also, I've always said before, people ask me, how do you feel about people asking questions about um, your blindness all the time? And I'm like, I love it. And they're like, you love it? I'm like, yeah, because I'd rather a person be curious than, uh, you know, have what's called a, a microaggression essentially and not ask about it at all and maybe say something ignorant or something that might be offensive or, or assume things that aren't true. And so I personally love when people are more curious, but uh, yeah, it had it had its moments, but I really enjoyed that. And I really, it was really a good way to make friends, you know, even though that was sometimes hard, really good way to do that. But as far as advocating for myself early on, I found it very convenient for my parents to advocate for me. Um, and, the, and the crazy thing is I was, I wasn't shy as far as meeting people. I wasn't shy as far as making friends. I wasn't shy as far as getting to know people. And I wasn't even shy about disclosing my disability. I was very much open about it at an early age. But I was shy about confronting situations that may have not been pleasant um, because I was then and still am not a very confrontational person. So advocacy didn't always come easy to be at a young age. And I had my parents there to you know, confront those situations for me. Um, so I was like, oh, this is more convenient. But naturally, you're going to get older and you're going to start having your own thoughts and opinions about the world. And you're going to start having your own desires and dreams that don't always align with your parents. And that's kind of what I've learned the hard way. And so it all kind of started when I was in sixth grade. I remember one particular story that was the pivotal moment for my self-advocacy journey. And I love what Maya said about you not wanting to necessarily be a self-advocate. You kind of being led into that. Um, because this story really describes that. And so I was in a school that, I mean, I, I liked it, I liked the people, but I was definitely having some difficulties with some of my teachers. And I was having difficulties with some of my classes. So I was in this math class and um, I've always not been very good at math, you know, even with the tutoring and everything, this is not my thing. I don't have anything against anybody that is good at math, I think they're great, but, uh, was never really good at it. So especially more visual math, like bar graphs and geometry and things of that nature. And this was a class that was uh, showing a lot of that math and we're learning a lot of that math. And um, I was really struggling. Like I was really, I was, I was consistently an A, or at least an A, B honor roll, not A honor roll student. But like in that class or just that year in general, I was really struggling. And it got to the point where I was failing and my parents called a meeting to talk to my teacher and they were ready to pull me out of school and send me to Governor Moorhead. Now, I have nothing against, you know, people that go to school for the blind. I, one of my cousins went there full time and he really enjoyed it. And I actually would go there uh, for different events and camps and, uh, and I would really benefit from that. But for me, I was very much happy in the mainstream outside of the work sometimes being difficult I really enjoyed integrating myself, I really enjoyed meeting sighted friends. And I, I, I really put my foot down about it because I was like, I really don't want to go to the school. I have nothing against the school. I just don't want to leave my friends. And I don't want to leave the education that even at this point was still working for me. Um, and my parents were really, but they were really very much ready to send me there. And it was my math teacher who stuck up for me. And he told my mom, look, you're, you're holding him back. Let, let me teach him math and let me tell him, let me, you know, help him learn how to do the problems and let him decide what he wants to do. And he really stepped up for me during that meeting. And so um, that really changed a lot. And he was able to teach me and help me. And I did pass the class. And I did well. And I went on to my second middle school. But it really sparked something within me, or at least started to spark something within me as far as realizing that I would, no matter how uncomfortable it was at times, no matter how hard or difficult it was, I would have to stand up for myself. And I would have to acknowledge that, um, yes, I'm, I'm, I have this condition, I'm blind, I have progressive hearing loss, but I can do what I would like to do in, the, in uh, this lifetime. So in middle school, or my second year in middle school, I had a VI teacher who 
uh, began stressing advocacy to me. At the time, I had no idea what the word meant. I never even heard of advocacy before. But she started stressing this too. She said, you've got to be a, a good self-advocate. Um, you're getting older, you have to be a good self-advocate. And I didn't know what that meant or what that would even mean for me in the future. Um, but I just knew that that was something that uh, I was being asked to do. I was, it was being called upon uh, for me. To, I was being called upon to do that. And so we brainstormed some ideas as to how I could do that. And I said, well, I'm a good communicator. I can communicate, but I'm not very big on being confrontational or always having to stand up and ask people for stuff. Um, and she said, well, how about you do it in writing? And so that was what started something that I did uh, for years to come. So even though I wasn't a great communicator, I found something, a strength that uh, I actually was really good at. Even though I was a great communicator, I didn't like standing up for myself. I found a strength in writing, which is something I know I'm really good at. And so I put my thoughts in writing. And I started writing my teachers a letter every, every semester, every year after that. And in the letter, I would talk about my disability. I would talk about my accommodations. But the most important thing I would stress is if you have a question about me, don't, you can ask my VI teacher, you can ask my parents, but first come to me, let's talk about it. Let's have that one-on-one -on -one communication and really discuss it ourselves. And that was like a, a magic button being pressed because it really changed the way that I really communicated with my teachers. Um, each one of them was, was willing to have that one-on-one -on -one communication with me. And they love the fact that I reached out. They love the fact that I respected them. I, I gave, yeah, I wasn't disrespectful. I said, no, nah, hard your job can be sometimes, but if you can't help me, definitely help me and do the best you can to communicate with me. And it really changed. Um, I, I really had a successful uh, school career after that um, from seventh to 12th grade because very much in part because of that letter. But it was also then that I realized that I, no matter how uncomfortable it was, I didn't really have to do this. I really had to stand up for myself. And mind you, I didn't want to. I didn't really care for it. Um, I was definitely more of the quiet person that was more concerned with just meeting people, making friends. But I knew that I would have to do that. And it so it really became a big part of my life. Um, and so I really worked with my teachers. Um, I had some, I know mine, I mentioned some free equipment. So I mentioned some of mine. Um, I had a, Early in early elementary school, I had a, a braille writer, which if some of you have seen it, it's definitely one of the old, it's kind of like a typewriter, but it's really loud. And trust me, I've had to advocate for myself in a lot of cases with that because I would bring it into classrooms and teachers would say um, things like, oh, this is too loud. I'm, you know, she's trying to take a test. I'm like, I understand that, but we got to find a compromise. So I have to use this device, especially in math, because the other devices I would have didn't. Uh, work with the code that works with that uh, Braille math is used in. So, um, you know, I had to use it then, but I also had uh, something that I'm actually have now, which is a Braille Note Apex. And that's kind of like a smaller typewriter. It's kind of like a laptop. It has a Braille display and it uh, has speech output as well. And it's also very good because you just use the Braille display without speech output. And it's a lot quieter. Um, and I also use a laptop with JAWS, which is a screen reader. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. And I have my iPhone, which also has a voiceover screen reader on it. Um, but I'm always definitely looking for, one thing I, I will say is going back to awareness, I'm always looking for new technology to use, always trying to uh, it, you know, learn new, new devices and really seeing what else is out there. Um, so this, this was, my technology definitely played a major role uh, in high school and in college, especially in college. And I'll, I'll get to that next in that, um, although I was very much good at advocating for what I needed and I got what I needed, I will say one regret I definitely have about um, not, not learning as much technology in high school was that I think that it made it a bit more difficult to communicate with professors in college because everyone was using technology. They were using email, it was that I wasn't familiar with it. I just wasn't familiar enough with all of it to really use it efficiently in the way that I wanted to. So I was really catching up and learning a lot. So I definitely say one thing to really focus on, uh, you know, if you have blind people that you're working with or blind students or you know someone, definitely early on, really focus on technology. And another thing that I did that really helped me was I attended my IEP meetings. And I know that sometimes students are intimidated by it. Um, I know, and even I was at first, I was like, I don't know, they'll set me in here, I don't know. 
but I had to, I had to at least uh, state my point and be honest about it. And thankfully I had teachers and people around me that made me feel comfortable doing that. They, they weren't aggressive. They weren't too intimidating. They were just very much open to hear my perspective. And so I was very vocal at that when I got the chance to be, you could start attending them really early, but I think the age where you actually can start attending them is 14. Um, I invited my voc vocational rehab counselor whose uh, job is to help me find a job after high school, help me in college, um, help me career readiness and, and uh, situations like that. So she came to my IEP meetings and pretty much everyone who would really help me progress after high school. So that was a big part of how I advocate for myself also. Um, now, when I got to college, things got a bit interesting. And so I loved my school. I attended the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And, um, you know, I was, I was very much active. I, I also, I hadn't really been in a lot of clubs in high school and things like that. And I really wanted to, um, you know, step, step up my game in that area and really start being more active. Um, and it really kind of started when I went to the Savvy program at Governor Moorhead, um, which Maya and I actually went to together. And she'll tell you that you know, I really started coming out of my shell more because I really started interacting with more blind people. And um, they have three different sectors of it. So they have the world of work, they have youth in transition, and they have college prep. So the whole idea is to really just get you ready for college, work, and independent living as well, living on your own. And also just to make friends, socialize and meet people. And I made a lot of great friends. You would have uh, all-nighter calls. And um, you know, I even met my first girlfriend there. And it really was a big part in me stepping out of my shell, but it also made me realize that if I just had the confidence, going back to what I was thinking about awareness and confidence, it really made me realize that if I just had the confidence in myself, knowing that I could stand up for myself and I could also just be sociable and meet people and just be uh, liked by people, because that was definitely sometimes a fear in my life, not always being liked by everybody, but it's just that I could really, if I stepped up, I could really increase the chances of that happening. Um, you know, it's it's, it's kind of like kind of like the saying goes. I think it's uh, you know, hundred percent of the shots you miss or the ones you don't make or something like that. It's just like if you don't take the chance to do something, you're not going to do it. Um, so it really helped me step up. So in college, I was uh, I got into this. Like I said, my technology skills were struggling, so I had to learn a lot about that. But I also was dealing with the new disability services. And a lot of them weren't necessarily trained on how to teach me. And they're very big on, well, let's uh, do the way that we know how to do things. And let's not try to be open to his ideas or what he has to say. Like, for example, when I would take tests and exams, because of my hearing loss, I prefer Braille. Um, I've come around on the computer and using the computer more and whatnot. But the time I prefer my test taking in Braille. And they were like, let's take this have him use JAWS or use a screen reader. And I was struggling with a lot of my tests because of it. But um, once I really spoke out about it and said, hey, I, I really took my tests better with Braille and the results actually showed that, they really changed their tune on that. And so I was really outspoken about things. And you know, my mom was really pushing me to be as you know even more outspoken. And I said, mom, I'm not gonna be here in four years. And she's like, yeah, you might not be, but people are gonna, people are going to come after you and they're going to need th those needs. And I, and I said, you know what, you're right. And that's, that was what really changed, not only changed my perspective on advocacy, but changed my perspective on my place in it. It made me realize that, you know, it's not that I didn't want to be an advocate, but it made me really want to be an advocate more because I've always wanted to help people. Like that's my goal. I've always wanted to be able to inspire people and help people down the road. Um, and so I really, it really changed my tune. So I said, well, even if I can't help myself, hopefully I can at least help people that come after me um, and leave an imprint on the university, not out of ego or, or anything like that, but just out of desire to help people and, and inspire people to do, uh, to be able to succeed in the way they wanna succeed. Um, and it also really led me to a lot of great opportunities. Um, I became part of the Student Advisory Board for Disability Services at UNC Charlotte. Um, because of my advocacy, and I became the chairperson of the board at one point, which I didn't, I didn't ask to be there, but I was, it was I was voted in, and, um, but it really was an impactful journey for me, and it really showed me that sometimes the unexpected can happen, and sometimes you can be put into positions that you may not want to be in, 
but that's okay because at the end of the day there's a there's a bigger purpose for that position that you were put in and i realized that and um i also became more active i joined some groups and um really started making friends in college and then when i graduated um you know it was during the pandemic and uh it was I actually graduated right before the pandemic started so I was, I was looking for a job i was definitely uh I really wanted to be an entertainer. I really wanted to be someone who, kind of like what Maya does and content creation, and things like that. Um, but I was also looking for other things and ways to uh, find an outlet to be able to give back to the community. And uh, that was when I, I got offered a job at ECAC, um, which uh, I've been in around ECAC before because we had our youth advisory team, which we had uh, built before I was at ECAC. But, um, I was, you know, hired there about, I think, September of last year. So I became ECAC's Youth Outreach Coordinator. And at first, I mean, I was, I was obviously excited about having the job, but I was like, ah, I mean, I hope I can, I can, you know, do this and fill these shoes and whatnot. And it really turned out that it was really a perfect fit for me. We started a newsletter. We continued building our team, um, especially during the pandemic, because we, because we're virtual, we got to add more team members throughout the state. Um, we continued uh, just doing different outreach projects. And it really gave me a chance to advocate for other people, but it really gave me a chance to hear other people's stories. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely going to talk more about that in the newsletter, Shameless Plug, which is coming out soon. So definitely look forward to that uh, sometime in the next week or so. And um, it, it was just a sense of community and communicating with other, others with disabilities that really helped me even grow more. And that was one thing that really helped me is just being surrounded and connecting with other people and realizing that I wasn't alone in this fight. I wasn't alone in my situation. I wasn't alone in my advocacy. And that also I could do it. I guess if you learn nothing else from what I'm saying today, just remember that, um, you know, have that confidence within yourself. Know that, um, yeah, all these things are out there for you and, and it's important to have awareness about what's out there but also have the awareness to know uh, what you wanna do, but also that you can get there. Um, you really just advocate for it and put yourself out there and, um, and, and, and also connect with people, especially if you feel intimidated, because I definitely felt intimidated at times. I definitely felt like I didn't belong, especially when we would do uh, you know, events with government uh, officials and things like that. I didn't feel like I didn't belong in the room. I, I'm saying I'm no politician, I'm not really anything like that. But it wasn't about that. It was really about me finding my voice and finding other people that connect with that in the process, helping people along the way. So, um, but like Maya said, I mean, I, I didn't necessarily want to be here at first, but now it feels like it was really meant to be. I was meant to be here. So, um, and I, that's a little bit about me. And I thank y'all for listening. And uh, I believe we'll now open, it, open up the floor for some Q&A. And the floor is... Filled with Q&A, Billy. We've got lots of questions in the chat box. Um, somebody had asked uh, for Billy, what is the name of the diagnosis? I typed in Nori disease. And then uh, I got a, hello, Maya. My name is Aditi. And Aditi, I apologize if I am not saying your name correctly. Um, could you please share the details of your YouTube channel again? Thank you. Yeah, so... Um, I don't know if y'all can see my name uh, on Zoom, but you find me by searching my name on YouTube and you will see a profile picture that looks just like this. <laughs> um, <laughs> and basically, like I said, I have a podcast called the Better Not Bitter Podcast. Um, we are towards the end of season two. Um, I also release original music on that channel. Um, I actually have a song releasing on Friday for Invisible Disabilities Week, because this week is Invisible Disabilities Week. Um, I also do vlogs related to spoken word pieces about my various conditions um, and informational videos like how to uh, make content that you post online more accessible. I just created a video, how to add alternate text to social media posts on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, for blind and visually impaired users. So uh, yeah, in a nutshell, just find my name by uh, looking up Maya Warren on YouTube. And then the next one was, whoops, let me scroll up here. 
For Maya, you mentioned that you took it upon yourself to research albinism. What role mm -hmm. did your parents or guardians have in supporting you in learning about albinism? That's a good question. So my biological parents didn't play a role, uh, at least not a positive one. Um, and they weren't really aware of the what albinism in itself was. Um, so most of my supports early on came from my visually impaired uh, teachers um, and coordinators, um, which I'm really thankful for. But by nature of me just being curious and, and when you have a condition like albinism, people really like to tell you what you have. So I get a lot of, oh, are you white? Are you this? Are you Puerto Rican? And I'm like, no, well, I think you are this anyway. And, and you get a lot of that. So growing up, I was tired of hearing that. And I, and it's a difficult place to be if you don't know yourself what you've had. So I had to kind of take it upon myself and do some self-education so that I could learn about my own condition. And through that, um, there's a sense of power you know how they say knowledge is power for me knowledge was power being able to know who I was what I have and not even be affected by what other people have to say regarding my condition <laughs> um so I was then a couple years later adopted by my biological grandmother and I was able to educate her on what albinism was and vision impairment and so together she was able to, like when I needed her, it was like tag team partners, like, okay, I took all the steps and I went through this teacher, this official, and they didn't respond. Okay, I need your help. Let's call DSB, let's, let's get on it. So um, being able to educate her and have her be a part of the team was, was very uh, important. Okay, for both speakers, you both seem to have outgoing personalities. How do you think your personalities contributed to you becoming an advocate while in youth? Um, I guess I, yeah, I guess okay, I, I was like, are you gonna go? Yeah, <laughs> I was thinking. Um, I think that, I, like, I think like us, I, I feel like even though at times I didn't um, initially, you know, want to be an actor, I wasn't really a conversational person. I was always very, I wasn't shy per se, but I was just, you know, very kind, try to be nice to everybody, um, try to get along with people. But I think that deep down inside, I also have a sense of this is who I want to be and this is where I want to go. And, you know, no, nobody is going to tell me that, you know, differently. I think that I've always kind of had that sense of as much of a people pleaser as I am, I think I've always had that sense of, I still want to get where I need to go. And at some point, uh, I'm going to have to, unfortunately, uh, move some people out the way. You know, not literally, but. <laughs> um, I agree. <laughs> yeah, but yes, yeah, so I, I think that that was really, you know, part of, part of, it really played a role in it. And um, I think that also, I was a great communicator in college. I was a communications major. And so once I get to know people, once I'm comfortable around people, I, am able to easily communicate my, my thoughts and feelings and once I feel confident in myself to do that. So um, I think that my communicative, uh, you know, nature and also just the fact that I, I really have a, have a sense, you know, I've, I've been told by a lot of my friends, when you're determined to do something, you want you, you do it. And I think that's kind of the person I always was. I can definitely relate to that. It's funny that uh, <laughs> I think I'm outgoing and, and but genuinely at, at, at my core, I am introverted. I recharge I feel you. when I'm by myself. I process things. I'm very methodical. I create. Um, but um, because of my passion for connecting people and connecting with people, um, communication has always been important to me and fascinating. And so even though I may have introverted tendencies, um, if someone were to ask me a question right now, like you guys are asking me a question, I have no problem answering it because I'm passionate about providing information in ways that help people understand and connect. Um, even in high school, I did a lot of communication related things. I, I was on the poetry club. I was in the poetry club. I was a part of 
HOSA, which is Health Occupation Students of America. I was a part of the Public Relations Community uh, Committee. Um, I, I did a lot of things and through just kind of forcing myself to get outside of my comfort zone, I became more comfortable conversating about things like my conditions and advocacy um, just for the sake of connecting with people. Uh, for both speakers, tell us about a time that you had to advocate for resources or equipment, et cetera, that you need to be independent and what was the outcome? Oh, I have so many stories. <laughs> yeah, um, okay. Oof. Are you gonna go, Billy? Um, I mean, I, I was gonna let you go, but I can, I can go. I can think about it for a second though. Okay. Um, okay, I guess I'll go. So trying to think of a most recent story. I've had several experiences. Okay. Um, so when it comes to self-advocacy, I believe self-advocacy has three parts. And one of the, the three components are knowing your condition or disability. I mean, like studying it as if it was a class in and of itself, because that's what uh, it, it's very important. Because if you know your needs, uh, you know how to help people help you. And so the second component is basically knowing what resources or accommodations you need based upon what you know about your condition. And then the third part is understanding who you need to work with, the resources you need to gather in order to obtain those accommodations and resources. And so this was the method, method I followed all through pretty much my entire life, but especially in college. And I remember uh, going to one of my favorite professors. <laughs> and so what I would do is before each class, every semester, I would meet with all of my professors um, just to kind of establish, okay, this is the face that goes with the accommodations letter. And this is the face that's going to be in front of the class um, and all of those things. And I was sitting in the office with him and I was explaining the whole albinism and vision impairment and the migraine situations. And he was like, okay. Um, and he's listening and receptive. And I remember thinking like, I really hope he's, he's not gonna be one of those professors that is my way or the highway. <laughs> Cause you can run into some right. professors like that. But to my surprise, he was like, okay, if you have any issues, um, blah, 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 just let me know. So I, I internalized that. I said, okay, I leave, you know, go forth and take the course. And the first exam comes up and, you know, he had proposed that instead of separate testing, like going to the disabilities office and taking the test, um, that maybe I could just go into another classroom and take the test. Um, so I'm in there, I tried it his way <laughs> and it was fine. And the reason why he structured it that way is because we still had class after exam, after exam, but I figured out one, I need my CCTV when I'm taking this exam. And a CCTV is like a computer with a camera underneath it. And you're able to slide you know, a book um, underneath it and it projects the words that are in the book or the piece of paper onto the screen and you can, there's knobs um, where you can change the contrast, uh, you can change the size. And I needed that for this test because the paper that, you, the, the ink that he printed with was very light. And so I finished the exam and then I have to send that email. <laughs> The email like, wait, I tried it your way, sir. It didn't work email. And um, so I met with him and I was like, I appreciate what you were trying to do, but I'm more comfortable and this works better for me. Um, and he's like, no problem, no problem. And uh, next test, that's what we did. And for the rest of the semester and through that, I learned, because over time, I'll be honest, sometimes, but most of the time, I expect people to be difficult. Uh, I expect there to be some conflict or some friction where people are having to adjust. Um, and I'm learning not to do that <laughs> because yeah. thankfully in college, uh, in my department, which was kinesiology, um, 
all my professors were like very were willing to work with me and so that really taught me not to hold everybody to a negative viewpoint when it comes to accommodations yeah I completely agree same here in the communications department um yeah I think my my most recent example um that's the one that I mentioned earlier about um it wasn't even with professors it was with uh, disability services where I felt I I, I knew that I what work best. I mean, I think my nail on the head as far as the three best ways to know to be a self advocate. I knew that um, you know I had hearing loss. I knew that because of my hearing loss, I would have trouble processing some of the information that I was getting and then trying to hear all that at the same time and taking an exam that way. And so I really had to stand up for myself and advocate. And I, and I get it. Like there, there's I understand that it's harder for them to braille things up and. Uh, they were like, well, let's really, really try this until it doesn't work. And I did. I, I actually listened. I tried it. I, it didn't work. And I think the results showed that this is what I needed. So, um, you know, they wanted me to use the computer and, and uh, take my exams at JAWS. But I knew that that, that Braille would, was uh, going to really help me be more independent in taking my exams and maybe not have a scribe there all the time or a reader there all the time to help me do that. So... I still use scribes, I still use people that were there to help me, but at the same time, I also was able to be more independent because I was able to read the test myself and actually process the information um, regularly like everyone else did. And so I think that was probably the most recent example, but I mean, I feel like definitely constantly advocating for uh, needs, but like Maya said, in, in some situation, I'll tell a funny story. Uh, when I was in fourth grade, I had this, this teacher I used to uh, spend time with and she would say, when you get to college, the professors are gonna laugh at you. If you don't do your homework assignment, they're gonna throw it back in your face. She was joking, but I took that seriously and literally. And so the whole time, and I think that had a lot to do with why it wasn't as confrontational with professors. I thought professors are gonna laugh at me and, and uh, throw things in my face. And I had a lot of anxiety struggles, you know, in, in high school and college. And I was telling my mom on the first day, oh, they're gonna laugh at me and throw things like, stop that, stop that thinking. You know, they're, they're gonna, enjoy having you. And, you know, it turns out that was the case. They really were very much open and communicative and they, they were always willing to help. You know, they were there to help and they were there to make sure that I got the same education as my sighted peers. So, um, yeah, I, I don't have too many problems to report on my professors. Okay, for both speakers, for a young child in elementary school, what should self-advocacy look like? And are there any parent resources to support and shape it? Um, elementary school. So I think one of the most important things, especially at that age, um, is really building a culture at home that embraces said disability or illness. Um, because what you don't want is <laughs> to kind of be in my situation where they have to go find out for themselves or they just don't know and you accept whatever one else is telling you. And I think one of the best ways to do that is to just go on the journey of self-exploration with them. So, you know, take for instance, vision impairment. If they have a vision impairment, teach them what the word even means. And in, 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 of course, elementary school terms, but as they get older, build upon that definition. Um, teach them to embrace the devices and the equipment that they use and that they are not something that makes them stand out, but they are an extension of their different ability. Yeah, I completely agree. And um, I'll add to that by saying, um, as I mentioned earlier, you can start attending your IEP meetings uh, at 14 fully, but I've heard stories of, of element, kids as early as elementary school uh, attending their IEP meetings. And so it could be intimidating at times for them, but for some, it might give them a sense of empowerment. So make sure that, and even if it's not for that, make sure that empowerment is there. Make sure they feel like they have a choice. Um, you know, sometimes I think at times some people, some kids may not feel like they, they're kids. And obviously as a parent, you have to do what you have to do for them. And, and you know, there are certain choices they won't have in, in school or at home. But try to create as many as possible, even like the smallest choices, like 
what do you want for dinner? Or uh, what would you like to do this weekend? Or uh, when they're in school, maybe, you know, hopefully they have teachers that uh, maybe let them choose what's, uh, I don't know, what's on the board. I mean, I've been in elementary school in a while. I don't know what they're doing, but, uh, you know, just really create those, those choices and those opportunities uh, for them to uh, make those choices. Um, and just also really build their confidence, let them know that uh, it's okay to fail sometimes, but also remember to ask for help. I think that was one of my biggest difficulties, even in elementary school, was asking for help. Like I remember one time I was in the after school program and I had this homework assignment that I could not seem to do. And I didn't want to go up to my teacher because I was like, my teacher's going to yell at me. She's not going to, uh, and my other teacher's like, that's, that's not true. That's not, you know. And so I took it up there and I asked for help and I got the help that I needed. So, uh, and if they can't always communicate that directly or, or say that they need help, you know, have them write it down. There's all, like I put my communication in writing that there's always a variety of ways to communicate that they need help. Uh, but find, a, find a, a, you know, something that works for them and it can really help them. And, you know, just make sure that they feel that empowerment and that confidence and really know that they can, that even with their disability, they can they can still advocate for themselves even at that age, and also like Maya said, just really ha- make sure they have a good knowledge on uh, what their disability is. How has technology allowed you additional independence in your daily lives, or created an interest in trying new things, shopping, traveling, hobbies, etc.? Oh wow, I love this question, especially as yes. a digital content creator. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> I spoke about like the, the physical modalities that I've used, the monocular, the dome magnifier and the large print books, but technology has played a very integral role in um, my disability and my illnesses. Um, think something as simple as uh, there's a feature in Microsoft Word where when you finish your essay or whatever you're typing, you can read it, it you can have it read aloud to you. And something as simple like that, when I have a really bad migraine and my vision is blurred, is helpful. Um, Another thing that has helped me in terms of like just everyday life, the calendar in the phone, because um, because of my my illnesses, I don't always have the strength in my hands to write. There's a certain amount of kinesthetic pressure that goes into using something like a pen or pencil, which you don't think about until that's kind of like an issue. But um, something as simple as having a calendar in my phone where I can keep track of things um, to kind of get around some of my symptoms. Another thing that has helped me in terms of what I do content creation wise, um, I, I, here's what I've learned. Sometimes with a disability, we feel the need to do things on the same level or in the same way that people who don't have a disability do them. And what I've learned is to not be ashamed in simplifying the process. Um, Mm -hmm. Because as long as it yields results of quality and thought and like effort, that's that's the goal. When you finish creating something and people can get the message or interpret it well, then you've done the job regardless of how simple the process is. So I use video editing apps on my phone to edit my YouTube videos instead of using a program like Premiere Pro and and Photoshop that really aren't visually impaired friendly at all. (laughs) Um, And I use uh, the Zoom feature on my phone. So when I'm creating graphic designs, images, infographics uh, and things of that nature, I can get the extra details just the way that I need them to be. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, technology is it, one of the beauties of technology. Um, I'll add uh, among all those things is is also connection, uh, being able to connect with others, uh, mm-hmm. having screen readers that can you can access social media if they're or uh, you know be, having the ability to uh, you know reach out to people and meet people. Especially, I'm sure Mike, with this being a content creator, but I met a lot of people online that you know you wouldn't have met had. Uh, you not have the technology that you can relate to and understand. Um, and so I think that's really important uh, as far as technology. And also for me, uh, I do have a regular iPhone with a voiceover screen reader, but I also have a Focus 14 Braille display that I can connect to my phone 
So it really helps me as someone who has uh, progressive hearing loss to really be connected because sometimes the iPhone either mispronounces words or it you know says words in a blurred way or I may not understand things properly. And so that's a, it, it's really a great tool to be able to connect to my phone and to be able to uh, access the information correctly and properly. Um, I also have my Braille Note Apex, which I use, and I'm able to uh, put documents on a USB and, and PowerPoints, which when I was uh, I, younger, I couldn't really read PowerPoints very well, but now I can put PowerPoints and PDFs on there, kind of reading through the Braille display. And so that's really good. But the technology is definitely, I mean, you have the uh, GPS tracker out there, which I haven't really used in a while, but I mean, it is, it is a great way to, if you're going out independently, it's a great way to be able to find places. Um, but it's just, it's, it's just so much that technology has changed about the opportunities that we have uh, and the ability we have to just uh, connect and, um, and you know, kind of like what I was saying, we don't do different things, but sometimes we do things differently and that's okay. But technology presents those opportunities that can really help us connect and really help us uh, get places and, uh, you know, just, just be able to succeed and do the work that we need to do. I see Ladessa shared, when one is a minority or has differences from social expectations, one is left with little choice but, so, but to self-advocate and educate. Thank you, each of you, for enlightening others. Each of you have self-advocated with family support throughout your academic careers. This leads to the following question. What can be done to encourage other youth to be more self-advocating? Um, okay, so... The thing that I find, uh, as I mentioned before, I have introverted tendencies. Um, the thing that I find that is really helpful for engaging with kids, young adults, youth, meet them where they're at. So if someone yes. has introverted tendencies, like meet them where they're at. Some people don't respond well to <laughs> certain forms of communication. So just getting to know their needs on a personal level so that you can understand how their personality works. Cause some people don't always respond to, well, you need to do this. Well, you need to do that. Sometimes people, especially if you're more introverted you respond more to, okay, how can I help you become better at this? Or what is what what would it take for you to see yourself the way that you, I see you like someone who's capable of self-advocating. So some applicable tips are just one, if you're the parent or the guardian, like make sure you're an expert <laughs> in terms of like, you know their condition um, and you know how to communicate about the condition in a way that does the person who has the disability justice. Um, Cause sometimes I run into parents who, who don't really give their child independence or the freedom or autonomy to even you know, be viewed in a certain way because of how they talk about their disability. And I think a lot of times that's because the parent themselves has to deal with whatever it is that keeps them from viewing the child's disability in a positive light. Um, so secondly, make it a point to say things like, you know what, you're such a good communicator. I learned so much from you when you tell me this about your disability. I really appreciate you telling me that. That took a lot of effort. You are, you know, things like that, because when you encourage people in that way, that says, okay, because as humans, we recognize patterns. So what they're going to say is, oh, so they appreciated when I told them this part of my disability, I can come to them again with something else about my disability. And so you become a safe place. And as a safe place, you also become a part of their support team. And through that support team, it goes back to that encouragement, which helps them have the courage to vocalize uh, about their disability and their needs and, and constantly reminding them, hey, you're not an inconvenience when you tell me you need this. Because something that happens, I know with me and maybe Billy can attest to this, but a lot of the times, sometimes why we don't ask for help or ask for things we need is because we feel like a burden or inconvenience. Yes. But you putting yourself in the position to say, hey, it, when you tell me this, I appreciate it. I want to help you. You know what? You're not an inconvenience. You're not a burden. Reinforcing those things 
built autonomy. So when they're in college or have a, a vocation, they're not going to have that viewpoint when they're talking to their employers or peers. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, you know, meet, meet them where they're at and just make them feel heard. I think I'm re kind of reiterating, but just make them feel heard. I think a lot of times, it's just in my experience, I feel like a lot of times there's a tendency for some people to uh, underestimate, you know, the value or the voice of the youth. They feel like, oh, they're just young people. They're just figuring it out. They don't know anything. They're, they'll, they'll say all these different things. And it leads you not to want to speak out on things because they feel like, well, they're already, they're already talking down on me. They're already telling me I'm not being heard. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I don't want to speak out. Um, and so I think it's important to just make them feel heard. And, and even if you may disagree with what they have to say, even if you don't think it's right, at least give them a chance to say it. And I think a lot of you are just, they just want the platform to say it. They just want the platform to be honest about their feelings. And if you, if you make them feel heard and, and meet them where they're at. And I also, someone who have, has introverted tendencies too. Um, I know that may not seem like that right now, but I do sometimes <laughs> have introverted tendencies. And, and at first I was, I'll tell you a story. I was uh, at this camp and they were really asking me like, Billy, what do you want to do here? Like, what do you want to, and they were making me feel like this roadmap. And I did not, I mean, being a, me being a college freshman, you know, I was typical standard, stereotypical college freshman. I didn't want to be anywhere that, uh, you know, wasn't a party basically. But um, yeah, I was in this situation and I was like, I don't want to be here. I don't care about this. And I was just kind of using my, my way through it. But as time went on, I, I, people were saying, we want to hear from you. We want to listen to you. We want to hear your story. And once I was given the platform to be able to speak out and I didn't feel hindered by anything, I didn't feel like, you know, it wasn't my choice or anything like that. I feel like I really was able to speak out more. And so like I said, just meet them where they're at and just make sure they feel like they're being heard and they feel like they're, they have a voice. Um, and, you know, that can really change and, and incorporates a lot of what they do. Like I was saying, it's like, if they're good at social media, you know, let them, you know, put their voice out on social media. If they're good at communicating, let them communicate and give them confidence. Let them know, oh, you did, you, you did this very well. Or, and, you know, or I could, and I can definitely relate to sometimes feeling like I'm being a burden by asking for help. Even now, like even as an adult, sometimes I struggle with asking for help because I do feel like I can be a burden. But I have to remind myself like, hey, even if they said no, at least I asked. I can't say I didn't ask. So if you just give them a platform to be honest, I think that could really change a lot. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll say one thing that you mentioned. Um, something that is really important. I have a lot of people uh, who have disabilities or chronic illnesses in their life. Well, I feel like I should be doing more in terms of advocacy in general. And my question is always this, what are you good at? What are you passionate about? Because I know some people who are great at gaming guess what? You can start a Twitch channel and just talk about your disability while you're playing a game. I know some people who are great at art. Just doing art and talking about your reasoning behind it can lead you to talk about your symptoms, your, the things that you experience. Um, and so I think sometimes society does a disservice to the disability community because we focus on it's got to be this way or the hard way. You got to get this 401k. You got to sit at a desk. That's a lot of us in the disability community that is limiting because we may have circumstances or things that prevent us from doing things traditionally. But what it does not open the door for is creative lanes, creating your own lane, whether it be through self-advocacy, or finding ways to work around your symptoms or the things that you experience. So learning and, and recognizing what the child is good at or the young adult is good at or the teen is good at and encouraging them to use that as a form of their voice, speaking through that thing that they are good at. I'm gonna uh, chime in real quick. I'm gonna launch a poll um, for the attendees because we are federally funded we are required to get data and report that to back to the feds. And so for those that are using, um, attending by a computer, you should see this pop up on your screen if you don't mind taking that. And then I've been trying to lay low because this is 
Billy and Maya's platform, but Maya just made me think of something that I wanted to share out real quick. Um, thinking about when we're talking about post-secondary options and being real careful to recognize that there is not a one size fits all to a lot of things and certainly not to those post-secondary options. And so at ECAC, we have something called the Matthew Grazaday Achievement Award. It's a scholarship that's open to any North Carolina senior or any North Carolina high school student that's in their last year of school, whether it's a private school, a charter school, home school, traditional public school, can be any type of disability. They can have a 504, they can have an IEP, they can have neither, they could just have a health plan. Um, but the cool thing about it is, is that that student would, the winner gets a check um, that is made directly to them and not to a university or a college because we recognize that not everybody wants to go on to college. Um, uh, people have all kinds of things they wanna pursue after high school. And so that money is for them to pursue whatever they want. So if it means I wanna get some updated equipment or technology or a new gaming system or a computer, or I do wanna to go to college, um, or if I'm you know, looking for a job and I need certain attire, um, but really respecting um, that everybody has their own individual dreams and goals and plans for after high school and not limiting it just to those that do want to go on to university or community college. So I just want, we're getting ready to um, put out the application for that this week. So be on your lookout if you are in North Carolina, because I do see we have some folks um, from out of state. So thank you for joining us. I've got some folks that want you guys to basically move to Arkansas, but you can't, you have to stay here with us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of positive feedback. Um, people are really saying, I really enjoyed this. Um, learned a lot. Um, a lot of people are subscribing to Maya's channel. Uh, as Deborah Thank said, <laughs> have high expectations uh, for your kiddos. And I think that's super, super important. And just to, um, for those that don't know, Deborah is Billy's mom. And I was laughing when Billy was talking earlier about sometimes what the um, individual with the disability wants and what time what the parents want don't always align. And, Bill, and Billy's mom shares, she had plans for Billy. He was going to be a preacher and that was that. And Billy had his own trajectory in mind. <laughs> well, I came with a little so, compromise, but yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think as parents, if you're a parent of a child with a disability, um, we also have a responsibility on educating our children when they're young. Um, oftentimes at ECAC, we'll take a call uh, from a parent. We'll say, oh, is, you know, is so-and-so going to the IEP meeting? And they say, oh, we haven't, we haven't told him or her about um, their disability. It's like, oh, man, come on. Let's get this self-advocacy into motion. Um, and the sooner and the, the better. And so sometimes people say, well, at what age do I you know, tell him or her, you know, that they have autism or this or that? And so, you know, a, of course, it's a personal choice, but I think the sooner the better, um, because then, you know what, they end up being uh, Maya's and Billy's um, and are able to self-advocate when they get into those situations where folks don't want to hear from mom and dad, such as college or such as in the workforce um, kind of a thing. And so um, there's so many things that we can do as parents. If you're here as an educator, um, building on those strengths, having students get used to saying, here's what I'm good at, here's what I need help, at, help with. Um, all those things, self-advocacy, um, there's, it, you're never too young to start. Um, thank you. Seems that each of you have embraced your challenges and helped others realize your uniqueness. Thank you. <laughs> thank you thank for your time. Thank work. You. It is definitely a journey. <laughs> yes, it is. And it's not over yet. It's still continuing. <laughs> That's right. Well, we, um, it's at just about 8.15, and so I'm scrolling back through and make sure we didn't miss any questions. Um, I wanna, was going to refer back to um, something that Ladessa mentioned as far as when one is a minority um, mm -hmm. with a disability. <clears throat> this is um, certainly a topic that comes up often because we do see that students of color, there's a lot of disparities um, oh, yeah. and di what we call disproportionality where those students are often um, over-disciplined. We see higher expulsion and suspension rates for them, under-identified, over-identified um, kind of a thing. And so 
um, there's a lot of additional barriers that can come into play for those students. I, it made me think of, I watched a documentary a couple years ago and I cannot remember what it was called, but it was the same guy, uh, producer that produced Intelligent Lives. And he would, had featured in this, it was a, a few self-advocates sharing their story. And it was a young um, black man who was in a wheelchair. And he said, you know, nobody, people don't assume that I was born this way. They assume that I got shot, that I was in a uh, gang, that I, you know, there was some criminal activity. Nobody would just assume that, you know, I was born with this condition um, kind of a thing. And so I think there's so much to unpack there, but we do see um, a lot, you know, and, and this is something that the feds are aware of. States have to report on this disproportionality. Um, and there's some groups out there that are really working hard um, studying the intersection between race and educational equity, um, figuring out why folks are under-resourced, how to get the information into their hands. So there's a lot of people out doing, out there doing a lot, a lot of good work. Yeah. Um, I think definitely... there's a question from Aditi. Let me see. I might've missed it. Okay. Well, I just want to speak to what you said. They're definitely, yeah, as, as, a, as a African-American woman, a black woman, I, I see it all the time. Like even uh, the resources I've been able to attain, uh, they were much later <laughs> in yeah. life than someone who has a, a bit more privileged. And one of the things that I'm very passionate about um, is kind of bringing that knowledge of resources to my community and, and um, being able to connect people. And I think So you somehow just got muted. Uh -oh. My, uh, there you go. Just the knowledge of resources. And one of my things is trying to bridge that gap, uh, even with things like my YouTube channel or just relationship with people. Because kind of having trouble hearing at you. At the end of the day, social media is great. Um, at the end of the day, emails are great. But what is more powerful than that one-on-one, face-to-face, word-of-mouth connection? And so... Uh, make sure that that is the case um, and, and bring an awareness to it because I think a lot of people don't realize that disability has always impacted the Black community at a disproportionate rate. Look at Harriet Tubman. Um, yes. She um, suffered head injury and head trauma, which led to disability, but nobody really talks about it. Um, Unfortunately, when there was the, the movement from slavery uh, traveling up north, Black people with disabilities were sacrificed <laughs> uh, at the hands of being uh, freed if you were able-bodied. So um, it has always been a disproportionate thing all around. And I think having discussions about it, but also doing the work of actively and intentionally engaging lower income communities and black communities with these resources needs to happen on a more often basis. Yeah, and I, I could definitely agree with that. And I think that, you know, it's definitely been just where even with uh, men, people with mental health situations or people, I think about some of my friends growing up and, you know, especially, um, you know, being me being a black man myself, I mean, I was, I definitely was, I don't, I was never denied services, but yeah, there are definitely times that I think that I received things later and I had to work extra hard to, you know, they always have this thing where sometimes you feel like you have to work extra hard and behave better just to, you know, be accepted by certain people. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I definitely have situations where a lot of my friends growing up where they would get suspended constantly or they've been in trouble and, uh, you know, they, they would just get written off by teachers or, or people that could really help them because, they felt, I mean, no one cares about me. So what am I, what do I care? Why should I care about myself? Why should I care about education? And also, you know, they could have had some situations. Um, I mean, I have family and friends that only as adults are realizing maybe that they have, you know, ADHD or they may have different disabilities that they have been struggling with for years, but they mm -hmm. never got the resources or the access to really speak out about it or be able to realize, you know, so I definitely, I agree. I'm definitely very much passionate about, you know, bringing that back to the community and, and really making sure that people feel empowered and people feel like they have access and awareness to things. Yeah, and a lot of it has to do with the Black community and our unfortunate relationship with the medical field because the medical field, yes. due to 
uh, racist and and unbeneficial structural practices that are we're still seeing ramifications for today. Uh, someone can look at a, a black woman who may present with uh, said amount of symptoms and oh you can you you're fine and yeah. that is that is very popular. I know people who have dealt with that with their own children being in the uh, NICU, but yeah. because they were black, they were dismissed and that child almost lost his life. So we have to kind of unfortunately deal with that so that we can have this, this influx of resources, but trust has to be built there as well. Aditi's question was for both speakers, how did you interpret and absorb indifference or reserve from peers even after self-advocacy? What would be your suggestions for a young child to not give up and keep going? Okay, I will, I will say this. Um, it can be difficult. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not gonna put on the front and say it, it's not. Um, I think, I'll give you one example. So I was at a family reunion and I was trying, this family member was asking me some very ignorant questions. Um, and I tried to explain to her what albinism was. And she was like, well, I'm just gonna call you whatever I wanna call you. Uh, and my family was like, kind of held me back. They were like, let it ride, let it ride, like, let it go. And I remember in that moment feeling like, okay, this is, this is my experience. You're telling me to let it go. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know the ramifications of her ignorance is having on me. And it wasn't until years later that, um, that I finally got to a place where I was like, you know what? The only thing that I have to be responsible for is communicating and educating. I am not responsible for what people do with that information. And once I started to kind of view it from that perspective, it, it, it helped me because ultimately my response to how someone receives my um, bout of education or advocacy uh, ultimately is trying to control how they respond. But if you spend your life trying to control other people's responses, it, it'll drive you mad. And so yeah. um, as a kid or a teen, the best thing that you can continually do is remind them, okay, you are only responsible for the knowledge that you have and how you present that knowledge and how you educate. There's gonna be people who just don't care. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be people who are rude and disrespectful. Something I say to people all the time, like, I don't mind you asking me questions. I draw the line at disrespect, making sure that they understand that that is an appropriate line where to draw things at disrespect, understanding that you're not responsible for people's responses and that ultimately by you sharing that information, um, you're building your own self-efficacy, which is your ability to see um, your ability to perceive how well you can do something. So every time, whether they receive that information or not, every time you advocate, you're building your own self-efficacy so that when you come across someone who does receive that information, your own self-confidence and the way that you present that information inspires them to go and then and take that information and teach others. Like, I can't tell you how many people have come to me after I've communicated certain things about vision impairment or albinism who've come, Maya, uh, I heard a family member say this, that, and the other. And I corrected him and I told him that albinism was this. And I told him that vision impairment was this. And I just remember thinking like, why are they coming back and telling me? And then I thought about it. It's because one, they obtained that information, they retained it, but they were excited about that. They, the fact that they were able to contribute to the cause that I sp speak for. I completely agree. And I I think, you know, it's about knowing what to give your energy to, because I, I definitely have had the tendency, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier about the fact that I actually like that people are curious, um, but like Maya said, I mean, I, there's a line, you know, you don't want to be disrespectful about it, but I prefer that people ask questions, uh, because I definitely think there have been many times where um, either people said something or, you know, they, they didn't mean to be offensive, but maybe it came out that way, and I'm, I'm pretty, I've heard it all at this point, you know, I've heard the blind jokes I tell them myself, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pretty uh, 
warm to that now, but I definitely have a tendency to want to change people's perspective. I definitely have a tendency um, when I was growing up, my parents said I should have been a lawyer because I will argue people up and down about things. And I've had to really learn as over time, there's just certain things that, you know, I, I just didn't give my energy to. And someone asked me one time, are you tired of educating people? And I said, no. I said, if I, if I have a room with 10 people in it and I can educate one person in that room, that one person can go change the lives of so many other people. I don't have to worry about those other nine people. Yeah, that's a, they're important and I should educate them. But if they don't want to listen, they don't have to listen. But I could just get one set of ears in that room to listen and actually do something with it and actually go out and educate others. I think that I've, I've at least won half of the battle. Um, yeah. And so I think when I started really giving my energy to that and really knowing uh, that and, and knowing how to educate and just really knowing that I can't change some people, but I can at least try to change one person, it really changed how I approached that. And, you know, I became less sensitive to it over time. Yeah. And, and I'll piggyback off of that. My motto as an advocate is one person at a time. And yeah. the reason why I say that is because as an advocate, you you're aware of the disparities. You're aware of the things that need to be changed. You're aware of the structural uh, patterns in society that don't lend themselves to really uh, acknowledge people with disabilities. But if you focus on one person at a time, what happens is you're able to devote intentional energy to that moment. And what happens is you will run across people who receive that information and then they go tell someone and then they go tell someone. And so think of it as little ripples leading up to a big wave yes planting seeds yeah <laughs> well, we've right. got about three minutes um question here do you think that there should be something incorporated into the school curriculum about accepting the differences in others yes i think that um be okay so when i was in college i studied programming for recreational centers and facilities for uh, underrepresented communities, i.e. people with disabilities. And when you're planning a, a program or you're building a new rec facility, the rule is the participants should match the percentage of the population that is surrounded by. So if there's this many people of a minority or this people of this type of background or these many people with disability in the community, then it should be reflected. And so I transferred that into these types of situations in school because the disability community is the largest minority internationally and nationally. Um, it should be reflected in our schools and I think even by providing more immersive classroom settings where kids without disabilities can interact with kids with a disability, that goes a longer way than let's say, hey, let's throw this in the curriculum because sometimes curriculum, uh, it does a good job of regulating, but it doesn't do a good job of stimulating. And I think stimulation is more impactful than regulating because ultimately most of the values we learn come from our parents and our surroundings when we leave school. Um, so even just teaching that at home and when they get to school, having the schools kind of making it less segregated um, can contribute to that. Yeah, and it definitely kind of reminds me of something I heard and I'm kind of paraphrasing here on, on a podcast I was listening to. They were talking about how like in India, they actually teach kids uh, meditation, for example, and that would be necessarily meditation, but like sometimes I think as, as good as education is, as good as it is to learn math and English and things like that, sometimes we have to learn skills that will help us emotionally. Um, like I just learned, we used to go to just to be fierce, go just to be vulnerable and go to therapy for the first time. Um, and I feel like sometimes that, enough of that isn't done in schools. Um, and, I, and I apply that also to acceptance of others. And, you know, Maya mentioned that sometimes we learn that at home. Unfortunately, you have homes that either aren't teaching that or are totally teaching that the wrong way. It's sometimes having that inserted into the curriculum is, is really beneficial in helping them and helping problems. And kids deal with that. You know, you talked about bullies earlier. You have people in the playground and it's all about 
let's address the problem by suspending them and taking them out of school. No, how about teaching them why what they did was wrong? Because they may not even understand that. You mm-hmm. know, so um, I, I'm all for uh, those kind of lessons being inserted into the curriculum and and lessons and lessons that can actually really apply to to life just outside of you know regular education and who we might encounter. I- yeah, if I could, I'd like to share one story along this line, if that's okay. So yeah, I was in high school and I was in PE court class. And because of my vision impairment, there are just some sports I cannot play. Um, and one of them is volleyball. Because once the ball is in there, I can't see it. So I'm like, I hope it doesn't hit me. Um, and so I'm sitting kind of like in the back because I at this time I had a chip on my shoulder. It's, it goes back to being that burden and not wanting to stand out. So I was like, well, I'm gonna at least stand in the back and try to play volleyball or move around. Well, as you know, sometimes guys can be a little more competitive in PE class than girls. And so I had one of those types of guys on my team and I missed the ball several times. And he turns and he screams at me, what are you blind? Mm open up your eyes he said a few more things and I remember I just walked out of the gym uh and that was my strategy for cooling down because I didn't want to say anything that I would regret in the moment because people respond different ways when they're upset um and I left and I walked to my IP teacher's room and when I walked to my IP teacher's room and I told her what happened she's like well did you talk to him and I was like I was mad. I didn't want to talk to him. And she was like, okay, bet. So I go through a couple of periods of class and I get a call in the middle of class that she wants me to come down to her office. So she had called that other student into her office who happened to be another student of hers. So I didn't even know he had an IEP plan. Um, so we're in there and she was like, tell him why what he said hurt you. And I was like, okay. And I said, okay, but I had every attempt. I was sitting there thinking like, "Mm, yeah, this ain't gonna do much, but we're gonna see how it goes. And I explained to him like, this hurt me because one, my vision impairment is not total blindness. But even if it was, uh, it is not something to be mocked at. It is not something to be called out for uh, and all those things. And he was taken aback he's like I am so sorry I had no idea no idea Mm. um and he was very like repentant and sorry but from that I took um I took that situation with me because I understood that some people just don't know and it goes back to I'm responsible for the information I give But if I don't give information, then I'm kind of playing into the negative ramifications and not self-advocating for myself. So had I said something in the moment, which in the moment wouldn't have been the right time because he was hopped up on testosterone from playing volleyball. But had I said something on my own accord, we could have nipped that in the bud without her even getting involved. All right, folks, it is 834. So I think we will wrap it up, but I definitely could listen all night long. There is a lot of wisdom between the two of you. Really, really great experiences and stories and just really good advice for folks. And so, yeah, so in the chat box is saying, yes, me too. So who knows, maybe we'll have a to be continued or a part two. Um, Definitely (laughs) something that we really want to... um, continue to put the message out is about self-advocacy and definitely encouraging um, youth, the younger youth um, to start early. And so maybe that's something um, we can look at maybe doing next is something um, with the intended audience of youth. So um, stay tuned, but thank you everybody for hanging out with us and going into overtime. Maya, thank you, thank you so much. Billy, thank you, thank you so much. You guys rock. And again, thank you everybody for the really good feedback and the questions. They said, thank you. You both are truly inspirational. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. All right.
Yeah. Well, that is a wrap. You all have a good night and I'm going to go, if any of you were able to see the dogs in the background, all four of them need to go outside now. So <laughs> <laughs> you all have a good night. Everybody take care. Bye. Bye. Have a good one.